Okay, okay, let's start. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome all of you in our first uh, coaching seminar uh, online. Uh, and also, I would like to welcome Mr. Jalou, General Secretary of IWF. And uh, I would like to thank uh, all the, the participants in this uh, 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 seminar. And also, I would like to welcome our lecturers today, uh, Dr. Chuba from Botswana. Welcome, sir. And also, Dr. Uh, Kyle. Welcome, Mr. Kyle. Uh, and think uh, we should start directly our our uh, our seminar today under title the sports psychology and uh, weightlifting. So please, uh, the floor now for you will start, Mr. Chivais. Okay. Okay. Uh, um. I'll start here. Um, our, our seminar today is uh, basically the title is Applied Sports Psychology for Weightlifting Coaches. Um, I've asked Dr. Tube to uh, be involved with this. We met, um, oh, back in 2015 at the African Games when I was with the Ghana weightlifting team in uh, Brazzaville, Congo, and it was a chance meeting. We were, we were eating lunch and he was sitting across from me and we started to talk and uh, I, I, you know, always enjoyed sports psychology, took a few classes and uh, so I was really excited to meet him and we've been in contact ever since. We met up again at the Commonwealth Games and uh, we talked even from day one about, um, you know, getting him involved in doing something with weightlifting and, and working on something together. So we finally were able to do that. So um, today, finally. So Dr. Tube uh, is a professor at the University of Botswana. He's a senior lecturer. Uh, he uh, has published, uh, presented uh, many publications and presentations. He received his doctorate at uh, Michigan State University, and he deals with both uh, exercise and sports psychology. Actually, there's a, you know, a difference. Generally, exercise psychology deals more with how uh, exercise can help, uh, help, help the mind. Uh, so it goes in that direction, but our focus more today, and even though we may touch on that, is how we can use psychology uh, to better help uh, coaches in working with their athletes. So that, that's our main goal today, is that coaches can go away from this seminar with some skills that they may be able to utilize to uh, enhance the well-being and the performance of the athletes they coach. So I'm going to let uh, Dr. Uh, Dubé just get started here. Okay, thank you, Kyle, for the kind and nice introduction. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen so that, um, okay, I believe you can see my screen. Kyle, can you see the screen? I can Yeah, I got it. it, it looked good there. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, colleagues, let me first uh, appreciate the privilege to spend this time with you. Uh, as introduced, my name is uh, Tsube. I teach sports and exercise psychology here at the University of Botswana. And I've had the privilege to work with a number of teams, uh, work a lot with track, uh, also with uh, football, soccer, and a number of sports here uh, in Botswana. So I'm privileged that I get to interact and spend time with um, the weightlifting community. So it's my first time and I'm excited to build network in that area and find myself uh, working with yourself. So for that, I'm very, very uh, uh, appreciative of. So we're gonna talk about uh, sports psychology and uh, applied to weightlifting. And we will discuss a number of skills, uh, but I'm so happy that uh, we have Kyle, uh, who is a seasoned weightlifter, a coach. So he will be coming in and out in the conversations uh, and 
I'll ask him some questions and he will also ask me some questions and we'll have a very interactive conversation throughout the process. So I've put together a brief outline to guide the conversations we'll have today. Um, I'll try to stick with it, uh, but uh, like I said earlier, we will kind of come in and out with uh, Kyle in the conversation. So at the beginning, kind of the foundational level, we will look at, uh, it's called the performance pyramid. Uh, it's very good, particularly uh, uh, when you start working with athletes at the beginning. I like it because it's very holistic. We'll talk a little bit about it. And there's a number of mental skills that are crucial for building the person and also building the athlete because uh, in the person we find the athlete and in the person we find the coach. And there are a number of skills within the performance pyramid, but we will spend more time today talking about goal setting. Um, Goal setting is very crucial because with goal setting, you build motivation. With goal setting, you also build athletes' confidence, even coaches' confidence as well. So, and then that's what we'll talk about. And then at, towards the end, uh, uh, Kyle and I will also have more questions and, and, and a conversation about maybe specific examples that he will use that him and I will use uh, uh, that are specific to weightlifting. So this is the performance pyramid. And like any other pyramid, uh, it has a foundation. And the foundation is wide at the bottom. And if you go to the top, things become, uh, uh, become smaller. And this performance pyramid, as it, uh, uh, we have what you call foundational skills or basic skills. And those skills are in the first level of the skills playing a fundamental role for performance. And the amazing thing about this is that it doesn't only apply in sports, can also apply outside sports, can apply in teaching as well. And doesn't only apply to coaches, also applies to athletes as well. And the number one skill at the bottom is attitude. So now we have to think deeply about this because the attitude that the coach has creates a climate within the team. It can be a very terrible climate, can be a very good climate. It can be a terrible motivational climate or a very good motivational climate for success. The culture built within the team. In addition to that, it speaks to the attitude of the coach towards the athlete and also the attitude of the athlete towards the coach the interaction, the coach athlete the relationship. Also the attitude of the coach towards the spot itself. For example, a coach who respects the spot very well and have a very positive attitude towards the spot, their philosophy will guide them to have good values. And the coach will be a good role model for the athletes that they work with. But a bad coach will not have good values. They will not have a very good philosophy that molds a good athlete and there will be a good role model. So the attitude, very foundational, and it's very profound that we think deeply about the type of attitudes that we demonstrate and we showcase. Uh, in addition to the attitude, now it's motivation. You know, um, I've had the privilege to work with a number of uh, teams and traveled within the African continent and also abroad. People talk a lot about motivation. They'll say, you know, our athletes need money for motivation. Uh, even in federations across the African continent, they'll say, you know, we need to give athletes food to motivate them. But what we need is to ensure that athletes' basic necessities are met. They have food, they have clothing, they have the training they need, all their basic necessities are met. And then when those necessities are met, then we can talk about intrinsic motivation, where athletes play sport because they love it, because they enjoy doing it. Because a lot of times we tend to associate, and I understand very well there is an intrinsic factor, but for the most part, our athletes, when they boycott at the games, or when they choose not to compete, it's because the, the basic necessities are not met. But now when we have a conversation about 
motivation from an academic sense. Uh, it's defined as direction and intensity of effort. Direction and intensity of effort. So we're talking about effort. Now we have to pause and say, okay, where is your effort at? For example, if you are the coach and you love weightlifting a lot, you will move towards weightlifting. So you will be attracted to weightlifting activities and a lot of things that are to do with weightlifting. But if you're not motivated towards weightlifting, you will not be moving towards it. You'll move away from it. Your behavior, your conduct, your daily activities will not be consistent with the values within weightlifting. So that's the direction aspect of it. Then the second aspect is the intensity aspect of it. These are related. So now the intensity is how much you move towards weightlifting or how much do you move away from weightlifting? For example, a lot of athletes all over the world, some are more motivated than others. Some, if training is at 4.30, they will be there 3.30. Some will come late. And when they're supposed to engage in activities, some will put minimal effort. But coaches and athletes who are very motivated, they put maximal effort. Now, we need to be motivated to do very well. For example, research shows that athletes who are most successful are very motivated towards the task that they execute. In addition to that, we talk about goals and commitment. And we'll talk a lot about goals today. Uh, you have to set goals. And I, very clear, we'll talk a more about it. So let me leave it to that time and talk about commitment. You know, sport is very, it's very different because people uh, uh, strive and work so hard to reach the top and work so hard to remain at the top. And it comes with uh, sacrifices. For example, student athletes, sometimes they decide I'm gonna post school and focus on sports. So I'm trying to balance the two and struggle with the two. So it takes deep commitment from the athlete as well as from the coach. But if the athlete senses that the coach is not as committed, then the athlete do not trust the coach. But if they both show commitment because their skills are complementary and working well together. In addition to that, now we have people skills. So it's important that we understand the people around us and develop social competence. And now we live in a global space. You don't just need social competence, you need cultural competence. For example, how things are done in Botswana may not be the same as they are done in Egypt or the United States or another part of the world. So now we need to celebrate the diversity we have amongst ourselves. And be respectful of the differences that you may have. For example, if you look at the African continent, we have a lot of coaches who come in and now we have to learn uh, the other person's culture and they learn our culture as well. For example, I, a couple of weeks ago, I had a conversation with a coach uh, 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 about uh, the use of muti in sports the use of muti or juju, whatever terminology or, 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 or area you, or, or what you may wanna call it. For example, if you ask an African, they may say, oh, that's great to use. And I think we need to use it. But someone from a different culture may not understand the need to use it or not use it and what it means to that particular person. So there's need for a very good cultural competence on both individuals and it's a conversation that the coach and the athlete needs to have and it takes really good trust uh, for both of them to have that conversation so now that, that's the, those are the basic skills at a foundational level and then when we move up to what you got preparatory skills there could be a number of skills of course but these are the two that we're going to have a conversation about in the pyramid it's self-talk self-talk talking to yourself and there are two types or three types, if you like. The first one is it's called instructional self-talk, instructional self-talk. So it's important for coaches to teach their athletes that they can, they can have athletes instruct themselves on executing specific skills in their sport. 
for example, if you need to raise your elbow in the task you are doing, you would instruct yourself that raise your elbow to the level it's supposed to be at. Lower your shoulders. So you give yourself an instruction about what you want to execute. Then the second part is motivational self-talk. Motivational self-talk. So motivational talk is very crucial. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's giving yourself positive feedback about yourself, like I got this. Motivating yourself through statements of affirmation that I am talented, I got this, I can be successful at it. But now, this doesn't only apply to athletes, also applies to coaches. A lot of times, uh, coaches spend a lot of time trying to build athletes' self-talk, confidence, and do little about themselves. That's why, for example, it's important for the coach to have high efficacy on this, for the skills and strategies that they have. Because if the athlete senses that the coach is not confident on the skills that they have themselves, then the athlete will not even have confidence in themselves. So the coach will also develop positive self-talk on the skills that they have about coaching. That, yeah, I can produce a world champion. You know, one of my friends is a, is a, a really good coach uh, at a global level. And we have these conversations all the time. You know, so when he started working with some top athletes, he didn't believe that he was skilled enough. That it was him who can produce a world champion. And doing positive self-talk and believing, having good efficacy that he can execute and produce that top athlete. And he trusts the skills and the strategies that he has. So in addition uh, uh, to those, we have got negative self-talk. It's when the athlete or the coach says negative things about themselves, really irrational thoughts. Like I never do well with this task. I'm never good at this. I never reach the path. So that's a negative statement that you don't want your athlete to be given to themselves. Then the sixth skill, mental imagery. Uh, imagery. So imagery, it's um, uh, uh, of course when you work with kids, they may think it was daydreaming, but we are talking about here. Um, mental images, mental images that the athlete creates. In some cases, these mental images have never occurred before in real life. For example, I could be a weightlifter and going up to the Olympic games. And then I create the images of my performance. And it's my first time there. I'm creating image in my brain and that has not occurred before. Or I could recreate an image that actually occurred in real life. Let's say I performed really well at the last African Games or World Championships. And I felt really great about the previous performance. And then I keep playing that in my mind of how I performed the skills and executed the task the way that I did. So one, you create something that's not occurred in your brain. And then you can recreate that actually occurred. So now, imagery can be complex, particularly for younger athletes and athletes who have not used it before. Because of two things, uh, the vividness of the uh, uh, image. Um, when you talk about vividness, it's incorporating all the senses. For example, if you need to hear something, hear it. Feel something, feel it. Touch it, touch it. Then the other part is control. How much control? Because when you are engaging in major research, it's mental possession. So you are activating your thoughts towards the task that you are imagining. So when you are doing that, you need to start the task, go all the way to the end of it. So now, you need to start and be in control throughout so that there are no other thoughts coming in all the way from the start to the end. So those are the two primary skills for preparatory skills. Then now, the last level, uh, which is performance skills. 
Uh, you know, a lot of times from experience, you find that that's where most people spend a lot of their time in level three skills or performance skills. So the first in the performance skill, it's managing anxiety, anxiety management and feeling butterflies in your stomach before you act, before you compete or when you think about the competition. So I'm gonna talk about this this way. Um, there's a concept that uh, 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 a friend of mine uh, uh, uses a lot. Uh, we call it the temperature, temperature. And we feel a certain way when the temperature is at a certain point. For example, when it's very hot, we take off our jackets because it's very hot. And when it's cold, you put on a warm jacket because it's very cold, you feel a certain way. The same thing applies with competition. When you perform really well, really great, you feel a certain way. And when you don't perform very, very well, you also feel a certain way. So now, to the coaches, it's very important for you as the coach to try your best to understand your athlete. And fully understand him when he's performing very well. And also when he's not performing well. Because when you know how he feels when he performs well, then you can try by all means to always mimic that environment and bring him to how he feels that way. And when he's not performing well and he's not feeling good, then you can try by all means to not make him feel that way. And there are a couple of things you can do about that. First, you can develop a routine. You can develop a routine. Competition for, 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 for practice as well as for competition. When you develop a routine, for example, let me speak about the one for competition. What time does your athlete go to bed to get enough rest before competition? A lot of times athletes at the competition, the following day, they are exhausted because the previous night they went to bed super late because they were thinking about the competition. But if you have a good routine, they know that they go to bed at 8 p.m. Before the competition, they get a good night's sleep. Then the following morning, what do they do? They shower. After the shower, what do they do next? All the way until to the competition. When they get dressed for competition, what's the routine like? Do they just put on their clothes? But they have to attach symbols to how they dress. Putting on your shoes, you start with your left or start with your right. Follow the routine all the way to the competition time. Be clear. How much time, when do you warm up? And how much time do you give between your warm up and the time you compete? You follow the routine very well to the point when you in the call room and it's time to perform. And if you follow the routine, then your body gets used to it. And when it's time to perform, your body is activated enough to perform. And in your routine, you'll include your self-talk and other mental skills crucial for it. But if you don't have a good routine, then your body doesn't know when it needs to do what. So another thing I want to talk about with managing anxiety is um, feeling butterflies in your stomach. So there are two ways that you can interpret the butterflies. One is as facilitative. Butterflies in your stomach, interpret them as facilitative. That the butterflies facilitate your performance. Facilitate your performance. Sometimes the interpretation can be debilitative. If it's debilitative, then it's anxiety. The athlete gets a sense of worry discomfort, then they start shaking, their palms are sweating. Now, if you're the coach, you need to see that pretty fast. But you can only see that pretty fast if you fully understand the athlete. And they're getting palms wet, they may need to use the bathroom more often. And you listen to them very well, they'll start giving negative self-talk. And they'll start saying, you know, I don't think I'm ready. 
uh, I, I don't feel good. Or they'll start justifying why they'll not perform very well. But now it's important now, the language you use as the coach in a space like that. Because if the athlete says, oh, I'm not very good, you don't wanna say, oh, you're as nervous as crazy. You don't wanna do that. You don't wanna say that. And you don't wanna say anything that will feather make the athlete anxious. The idea is to calm him down. Also because for the most part, for the most part, during competition, there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of anxiety. So now it's very important to calm athletes down and have them rush and calm down. Then managing our emotions. Emotions are very, play a key role in sports. Both good emotions like excitement, joy, or sadness, uh, grief and pain. For example, um, an athlete could perform really well at the first round and be completely excited and overexcited. And then that affects the next performance, the next round. And because they perform, perform well at the first round, then they get so much excited and then they change the whole plan and fail to stick to the plan. Or sometimes they don't perform very well and then they become sad and have a lot of guilt and lose their confidence. But it's just one match or one competition that they just had. And this should not define their entire performance. Then the top of the, of the skills is concentration. A very interesting concept uh, and very crucial in sports. And during the performance, as the co games continue, athletes compete, they get fatigued. And it affects their concentration level. And that's where it's most critical. So now, what I want to talk about here most profoundly is that uh, what coaches normally say to athletes about concentration or about focus or about be attentive. They will say, focus. But if you say focus, that's incomplete. Focus on what? So now, concentration and attention can be, can take a number of directions. It can be internal. Focus on something internal, like your thoughts. And if it's internal, it's something within yourself. Like when a coach is planning the strategies for the athlete, he's having an internal attention. So all the thoughts are internal, but it can move from internal to external, from internal to external. So if it's external, the person, the athlete or the coach could be looking at maybe the weight in front of them. So they are attentive to the weights. That's where their attention is at. Moving from internal to external. So it's important for the athlete and the coach to know where their attention is at all times. Is it internal or is it external? Before the competition, the athlete could be thinking a lot, very, very internal, trying to plan the game and that putting them a lot of under pressure. It's okay for you to have a conversation with them so that they don't think a lot about the competition, internal to external. But it can also move from narrow to broad, from narrow to broad. So narrow in this case means one or within a specific locality, like specific area, or broad where it's multiple. You could be attentive to one or multiple. So it's important at all the time um, where your attention should be at. For example, for you to be to do very well in weightlifting when you are lifting the weight, where should your attention be? Internal or external? Uh, focusing on one thing or multiple things. So it's very important for the coach to always reflect on such. So I'm gonna pause here and let uh, Kyle um, speak a little bit about the performance pyramid and then we will transition to goal setting.
That was great. I got a couple comments and, and, and some questions for you there. Uh, I really like what you said when you talked about motivation, about oftentimes we forget about basic needs of, of athletes. I think even now is an important time. I think we've seen during a lot of lockdowns and such that athletes might have even more uh, specific basic needs regarding, you know, f- food, clothing and, and such. And yeah. um, like, uh, you know, one thing I've, I, I know that uh, oftentimes uh, a, a quality of a good coach is one that's a caring coach, one that cares about their athletes that outside of uh, competition, it's not always about how much weight can you lift, how many lifts you, can you make in weightlifting, but it's, you know, do you have something to eat? You know, do you have, do you have clothes? You know, how is your family? You know, how are you doing in school or how is your job? And, and I know coaches that, that have had a good, big influence on me, uh, both that I uh, played for and, and um, that I've worked under as coaches were, were coaches like that, that and, and athletes can see if the coach is sincere also, you know, not just saying, hey, how you doing today, but truly care and then, and then actions to make sure that, that the basic needs are taken care of. Because, you know, if you don't have some of those basic needs, then you're not going to be motivated to do sports or to, to you know, to train or perform. So that's a very good point. I like that you brought that up there. So I had another, you know, I wanted to ask you about people skills. Do you think that people skills are, are something that either you have or you don't have? Can you, can you, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that as far as, <laughs> Yeah, you know, somebody says, "Ah, oh, so and so's got good people skills," and you know, are those? Are they, is that just their personality, or you know, what are your thoughts on whether those people skills can be developed? Yeah, um, it's a little bit of both. Uh, they certainly can be developed. Um, people have to be deliberate about it and to acquire the best skills. There are courses you can take. There are classes you can take for it so that you have good social skills and social competence. Uh, and these are tied a lot to the culture. So, 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 so there are a lot of uh, 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 classes you can take about it. So uh, uh, in a nutshell, yes, you can tr- be trained and be very good. Just like, uh, you know, uh, they're great speakers and those who learn to speak, you know. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and we have to be, you know, we have to be deliberate about it. We have to be intentional about it, you know. Um, you know, in, this, in the business we are in, intentionality is very key. Even uh, conversations about does sport build character. Sports only builds character if there's good intentionality, if there's good leadership. But if there's no good leadership, then it's not a good environment for kids. Right. Yeah, we, you know, you hear so much about people about, you know, uh, I work a lot with uh, young uh, children in, in weightlifting. And you always hear about, you know, how it can help develop uh you know, discipline and self-esteem and, and, and some good qualities that may carry over into other aspects of their life. But, you know, it can be negative also, just as you point out, just the participation alone doesn't cause you to have good self-esteem. You might, you may, you may develop poor self-esteem, you know, it, it needs to be a very uh, good environment. You're, you're right about that. Um, yes, it, it- let me give you, a, I can't remember, there's a, a good sports sociologist, I can't remember his name. He wrote something interesting about the environment within sports that it's only good if there's good leadership and coined a concept talking about gender-based violence and um, kind of, uh, and he called it the fast food sex mentality within sports that uh, how sometimes women can be treated and people can learn that from sports if we don't uh, uh, have good leadership within the sports, terrible skills can be learned. And I think uh, that goes, the one thing that goes along with is, is being a good listener. I think that's something that, you know, myself and uh, that I, you know, have to make sure that I'm listening to what people say and let them know that I do hear them, you know, respond as such <laughs> that, you know, I'm hearing what you say because I may not hear what they say. So oftentimes I know if you can respond to someone to let them know uh, 
what they're saying. If you know, they you know, if they like that you know what they're trying to communicate with you, and so it's always good to check as well. So, yeah, people skills are are so important. Yes, and let me say this about listening, particularly working with those who work with youth. Um, uh, so it's very important to have particular youth understand and be clear that you are listening to them. And one basic thing you can do, you know, youth are normally always young for the most part and the coach will be the big guy. So it's good to just lean down, bend and listen to them and have them realize that you are really looking at them and paying attention to, to what they're trying to to, to share with you and you'll be very, very be able to, to listen. Thank you. So on, on mental imagery, you mentioned uh, that, you know, you may think of something big, like, you know, you're at the, you know, you're maybe a young uh, weightlifter and, and uh, you're, you, you imagine yourself at the Olympic games, you see yourself just like it's being reported on TV. And, um, but I think you mentioned also it's good to be like in real time, like imagine mm -hmm. yourself at a local event or I guess even in, in uh, training, you know, you know, think about I've worked with athletes who, you know, are going to have a big day the next day. Maybe it's not even snatch and clean and jerk, but they're going to try to get a personal record, personal best in the squat. And uh, I encourage them to start thinking about it that night, you know, and um mm -hmm. You know, so I, I think it, that, you know, I agree with you that you got to think of it at different levels. It's okay to have those dreams. And I think you'll talk about that more when we talk about goal setting. It's great to have those big dreams, but sometimes you need to make, you know, you need to deal with those, you know, smaller events as far as your uh, imagery. Yeah, it has to be realistic. Um, for example, if you, if you're still at a regional level, of course, it's okay to dream big and inspire yourself, but it has to be realistic as well and be very, very practical. We'll talk more about when we discuss goal setting and how to set goals yeah. and things like that. And, and you said also that you do mental imagery both externally and internally. So you, you see yourself on the yeah. big screen, but then also you feel yourself from inside, right? Yes, uh, watching like yourself in the like, like watching a movie of yourself or you be in the yeah. movie yourself. Okay. I got um, anxiety. I guess we could talk talk on anxiety forever. You know, I got a little nervous here because this is live. You know, so I, that's a little <laughs> little anxiety. And uh, when I was an athlete, I was I was pretty anxious. Um, I think I was, as they say, I was more motivated to avoid failure than to, uh, motivated to achieve success. <laughs> and so because of that, I always, um, I, I try to, you know, I think it's important to in, instill in the athletes, uh, you know, that confidence and, and, you know, believing they can perform. And uh, one thing that you can do in weightlifting um, is with younger kids, you know, you pick the lifts in competition. Uh, the coach does, you know, working with the athlete there as to, as to what lifts they may take. And my experience has been with younger athletes is to be on the conservative side and, and um, you know, pick those lifts that they have a greater chance of making. And oftentimes I've had uh, the athletes say, uh, you know, coach, I could have lifted more. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, I know you couldn't, you know, you can do that next event or their parents may have said, I've had their parents pulled me aside and say, I think you're holding our kids back. And I said, well, maybe I am, you know? So, uh, you know, I think it's important as a, as a young athlete to do things to, to ensure success, even in uh, training, we, we're good at keeping records on not just how much someone can snatch and clean and jerk, but, um, you know, how much they can do for the squat for five reps or how much they can do in a, you know, push press for, for three reps or, or whatever. And, and that, that builds, I think, you know, you can go back and talk to the athlete and that builds up some confidence there. And I think the more confidence they have, uh, the less anxiety they, you know, exhibit during um, competitions. What are yes. your, what are your so, thoughts on uh, that? Yeah. So, for example, managing anxiety, it's very important to develop a, the routine I just talked about. 
Uh, in addition to that, there are some things, techniques that you can use to calm yourself down. Um, the other, one of the strategies is to do centered breathing. If you take a deep breath in, you hold and you breathe out slowly. And when you do that, it allows your body to relax. And the good thing about that is because you can do it really anywhere uh, before you execute. And also to ensure that you also relax your body and, and you're as calm as, 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 as possible. Also doing positive self-talk that, you know, I can calm my body down. I can do this. I can be very successful at what I do. It allows you to calm your body down and also try to interpret the butterflies as gonna help me be successful. But also one thing that you talked about, about deciding what weight to start with, um, uh, it's very important because if the athlete feels it's too high, then it raises up anxiety for the athlete. Um, so it's important for the coach and the athlete to agree on where they're gonna start at. Because like you said, Kyle, there could be athletes who their motive is to avoid failure. So the idea is not to be successful for them, but to ensure that they're not ridiculed or made fun of to have failed. So for an athlete like that, you wanna build their confidence and start with them where they, where they will be successful and build their confidence from that. But also context can be very crucial here because for example, we know actually research shows that they could be athletes in Africa who don't have a lot of autonomy and will just for the most part do what the coach wants them to do. Uh, so if you're in an environment like that, it's important that you try to build athletes autonomy as well so that they can be free to share their thoughts and, 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 and tell you what they feel they'll be comfortable at. Let me give you an example. When I, I was an athlete, we traveled to some games in Thailand and we had a high jumper in the team. And he started at a way higher height that he went and dropped three bars. And that's the only thing he had gone there to do. And that really had his confidence because he flew all the way to Thailand and did not clear any bar because he started way too high. And that affected his confidence. But if they relate well with the coach, they say, maybe you can start here where you can manage. And then they will all progressively move and build the athletes' uh, uh, confidence as they, as, they, as, they, as they move higher. So that sense of autonomy is very, very crucial. Actually, doing that for athletes, it's an autonomy support. You are building a sense of autonomy for the athlete uh, uh, because they, they also have a, a, a key role to, 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 to play. And just one last uh, comment on this performance pyramid about the concentration. Um, something that I've found that is that, you know, concentration needs to be practiced. I think oftentimes, and, you know, you're the expert on this is, you know, I think sometimes we look at sports psychology as something you do right before competition. <laughs> and, you know, you throw it in at the end there. Let's throw this in the mix rather than, I think it needs to be, you know, performed, um, you know, from, from day one. I always I tell the kids, I ask them a question. I said, what's the most important repetition in a set? And they'll always say the first one, the last one. I say, no, it's the one you're doing right now. You know, it's that one, <laughs> the one that, that you should focus on each and every repetition. So, you know, do, do you think that it needs to be practiced or, you know, from, you know, throughout? Yes, all mental skills need to be practiced throughout and including concentration. And there are really good ways because um, as the athletes, gonna, let me say that they're, they're out uh, competing. So now they need to know what they're concentrating on, where their attention is at. For example, if they're out trying to lift weight, but they are thinking about spectators, then their attention is away. So they need to block the spectators and have a tunnel vision and focus on what they need to focus on. There are many ways of teaching that if you're the coach or the sports psychologist, you could deliberately distract them during practice. And they are trying to focus and then you're trying to deliberately distract them. So they learn to block that and focus on what they're trying to focus on, which is very crucial. 
One, uh, what we used to do with a tennis player, we would connect a horse pipe and they'll try to serve. And then you hit them with a horse pipe and they're trying to concentrate on serving uh, 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 while they're trying to block the water, hitting them uh, 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 and learn how to block that. Uh, the number of techniques that you can use, uh, for example, um, there's a simple uh, 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 concentration grid developed where you can learn how to concentrate by looking at specific numbers in the concentration grid. Uh, you can do that when there's a lot of silence or when there's a lot of noise. And when you, there's a lot of noise, you try to block out the noise and focus on looking for what you need to look at. So there are a number of strategies that one can use to learn how to, to focus on relevant cues uh, uh, that what you need to focus on. Thank you. I, I want to mention, I see in the chat, uh, in the chat, we're starting to get some questions. So what we'll probably do, I think, uh, Dr. Tube is wait, uh, wait towards the end there. We'll keep the questions and we'll, we'll cover those. So I'll let you go ahead and finish up, uh, go on to goal setting there, and then we'll uh, get to the questions there that, that we see in the chat room. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. We will continue the conversation, move to goal setting. Um, you know, I want to just start maybe conceptualizing some terms within um, goal setting conversations. And the first one is, uh, uh, what is a goal? Like when you think I'm setting a goal, what exactly do you mean by that? And it's a, a specific standard or accomplishment that one strives to attain. For example, could be a certain weight you want to be able to lift, uh, or if you want to lose weight, it's a certain number of kilograms or pounds that you want to that you want to to, to lose. So it's a, if you like, just a statement of intent uh, uh, of what you want to achieve. But now, when you talk about goal mapping, it's slight, it's different. It's now you changing your behavior so that you can meet the goal that you want to meet. For example, a systematic approach to acting. So now what you do should be different from when you had not set the goal before and thinking in purposeful ways. So now your thoughts now are deliberate towards achieving the goal you want to achieve. If you wanna win an Olympic medal, you don't think and behave like someone who doesn't wanna win an Olympic medal. It means you develop a routine. It means you engage in uh, demanding physical training mental training, you change your nutrition, you change a lot of things, you change completely your lifestyle. So now, because of the goal that you want to achieve, you act different, you do things different to meet the demands of the goal that you want to, that you want to achieve, uh, to achieve specific accomplishment and personal fulfillment. For example, if a country wants to win 10 medals at the Olympic games, they need to do things different than a country that doesn't want to win those medals at the Olympic Games. For example, you want to win 10 Olympic medals? You need to look, okay, what do I need to do that? Uh, what resources do I need for that? Rather than setting a goal and failing to provide resources for it. And also I'm going to deviate a little bit because I talk about goal setting here, uh, particularly in sports, because we deal with this all the time. Uh, a country would say, okay, I want to win, I want to build five medals from the Olympic Games. And is the chief executive officer of the Olympic Committee, or maybe in a couple of uh, board members. And the Federation is not aware, the athletes are not aware. But if you want to set a proper goal for success, you put everyone in one room all key stakeholders in the same room. And then what we wanna achieve at the next Olympic game, we think you wanna win five gold medals. Where do those medals come from? And what do we need to get there? And everyone is part of the goal development at a national level. But if three people or five people formulate that on their own, and the coaches are not aware and everyone is not aware, then athletes won't own up to the task. They don't feel it's part of them. Or if we drop it down to maybe a club level, 
if you want to achieve certain accomplishment at a club level, everyone at a club level should be part of the goal development. From the cleaner, from the person who brings food, from the security guard, everyone within the club should feel should be part of it. Because if one of each one plays a fundamental role, they're a key stakeholder, including the driver, for example, if you have a full-time driver because he drives athletes to the competition. If the driver does not feel that part of it, they can drive over the speed limit and get, and be, get a ticket and they stop there with the police for 20 minutes, athletes get to the competition area late and everyone is very nervous. But if the driver knows that he's part of the game, he has a key role to play, everything he does, it's to build success for the team. Even people in the kitchen, for example, if they know that they are cooking great food for the athletes, they'll work really hard and ensure because they know they play a crucial role. And they'll put maximal effort in the task that they are doing. So it's important that everyone is part of the goal uh, 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 formation uh, uh, if it's at a, a country level. So now people can ask, why is it important for us to do goal setting? It's for a number of reasons and research provide this evidence very well. Is that when you have a goal set, let's say you wanna win a gold medal in the next Olympic games, it now gives you the privilege to direct your attention to relevant things. Sometimes not everything is relevant to priority things towards your athletic success, like what to eat, what to train for, how to train, and all the necessities for that. Also, it allows you to increase the effort you expand towards the task, because you know that you need to achieve a certain standard. And now to achieve that standard, your effort needs to match that so that you can achieve the standard you want to achieve. And also to be more resilient and be more persistent over time towards the task. You fail, you put more effort in it, and you're more persistent in it so that you can be successful over time uh, uh, in the task. And then you can come up with strategies, uh, goal achievement strategies for success and develop those strategies so that you can be successful at it. And also this strategy is not only strategy for the competition, even for practice. What do you do during practice? and building it up all the way to competition. So it's very, very important, particularly for those reasons. It allows you to be more persistent, put more effort, and put attention towards what is relevant and crucial for, 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 for the task. And there are different types of goals. Uh, we have what you call subjective goals, which are really general statements of intent that I want to win them. I want to reach a podium finish at the Olympic Games. So it's not clear which Olympic Games. It's just a general statement of intent. So it's very important uh, when you talk more about this. Uh, and I know this is probably a global phenomenon. At the end of the year, people uh, think about uh, new goals. And then they have what's called New Year resolution. Like I want to save $10,000. So I want to lose 10 kilograms or whatever the case may be but they don't do anything to meet the goal. They come with a general statement of intent and they don't do anything to meet it. For example, there was how I save $10,000. Then they never put money aside so that they reach the $10,000. By February, 60% have forgotten about the, those goals. By June, maybe 80%. By October, there are plenty of new goals. And it's a cycle, it goes on and on and on. But when you talk about objective goals, a scientific definition of it, it's attaining a specific standard of proficiency. So now with a proficiency, you can measure it. The time or weight or distance in a specified time, in a specified time, like this period. For example, personal record for 10 repetitions in the back squat in the next training cycle. So very clear what you want to achieve 
when you want to achieve it. So now, if it's clear, 10 reps. If you're making eight, okay, you should be making 10. And you can measure that pretty easily. When, next training cycle. When that time comes, you can evaluate to see, do I need to revise my goal? Oh, I'm doing very well. Oh, it's too easy. Can I strengthen it a bit? So it has to be very clear what you want to achieve and how would you know that you've achieved it? Other type is what you call outcome goals. Outcome goal. So an outcome goal from an academic conversation, it's a, 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 it's a standard based on uncontrollable results or outcome. So the reason why it's that is because it's dependent on how others will fare on that particular day. And it's, it's a, 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 the competitive result of an event. For example, win a gold medal at the Olympic Games. So for you to win a gold medal, it means that someone has won a silver medal. And your result was dependent on how the other person also fares like winning the championship. So you don't have control over what the other person does. You can influence them, but you have not control over that. Outcome goal, winning a gold medal, winning the championship. Then performance goal, it's um, goals that are self-reference, standard based on self-references or personal uh, accomplishment, like improving your personal best. So you make your, a goal that you compare your, what you want to achieve with your previous performance. So you look, okay, where am I today? I'm at this level. So what do I need to do to go to the next level? And then you are improving your performance from where you are moving forward. For example, uh, breaking your personal best by five kilos. Of course, breaking, five, uh, breaking your personal best by five kilos could mean that you win the gold medal or put you in a gold medal position. But you have set a performance goal. Then what do you call a, a process goals? And these are tied to execution of the tasks that you are engaging in. They are based on controllable thoughts or actions related to performance execution. For example, arrive to training on time. If training starts at 4 p.m., be there before then, so training can start. Because if you are not there on time, then you're going to start late. And then short-term and long-term goals. And the kind of gold standard for a recommendation here is that short-term goals should have more should be more performance and process goals. Those that are self-referenced as well as those that are tied to specific executions of this skill. Specific executions of this skill, short-term goals, but long-term goals, outcome goals. So, okay, the next Olympic games, if it's in two years, oh great, win a gold medal there. But for me to get there, what do I need to do? performance goals and process goals. And this brings to the staircase approach to goal setting. And if we look here, we see the trophy and it symbolizes uh, an outcome goal that you wanna win a gold medal at the Olympic games or get a trophy, win a championship. But now for you to get to the top, you need to start at the bottom. For you to get to the top, you need to start at the bottom with process goals. I have to practice on time. Have a specific goal about your specific body movement towards training. And Kyle is gonna give more specific weightlifting examples. For example, in track, foot placement. Think about reaction time. And a process goals. And then you have good process goals, then they feed onto the performance goal. And then they feed on to the outcome goals. Of course, a lot of times people just spend more time thinking about outcome goals. 
that I want to win the gold medal. But there's a process to it. And if we start at the bottom, we go all the way to the top. Just like in any building, you never fly to the top of the stairs. You go from the bottom, going all the way up. And there's some interesting studies that have been done that speaks to uh, the different type of goals in relation to behavior change, in relation to behavior change. So now the key here is that all the three types of goals play a key role in behavior change and success in sport. All the three of them. The key now is knowing when to use which type of a goal. Not focusing all the attention on outcome goals, but using a combination of them as the example provided earlier that I've used in the staircase approach. But now, research shows that outcome goals can facilitate short-term motivation because it feels good to win a gold medal. So when an athlete set a goal like that, they feel pumped up, but it's only short-term and may lead to anxiety at the games because now the athlete interprets and remembers the goal and that can put more pressure on the athlete. I've seen some coaches who would say, okay, we're gonna set performance and process goals up to this level of the competition. And when we get to that part, then we play, we move one stage at a time, one stage at a time until you are in a medal position. So the key is knowing which goal applies when. So uh, I think this is pretty standard uh, about SMART goals that are specific, which is what is it that you want to achieve? Do you wanna break your personal best? By how much? What is that you want to achieve? And then measurable, to be able to measure it and evaluate it. If it's time, yeah, we can tell that, okay, or kilos, it was supposed to be nine, now it's two. So you can be able to measure that. But goals should be aggressive, should be challenging, not the most simple, but something that you can achieve, but also challenging you so that you can apply yourself also, but achievable. And then reward, you know, you succeed a little bit. It's okay to rejoice and celebrate and give us a positive feedback for it. But now it's great if the feedback enhances your achievement of the goal. And this happens a lot at the games, particularly after the games, the athletes has won a gold medal, then they go on a drinking spree and then something happens, they get injured or something. And they were trying to celebrate so much. But it's great that you realize, oh, okay, I've done so well. And then you do something to enhance your goal. And it has to be clear when you want to achieve your goal, by when. And, and, and if it's a long time, so okay, put a time to it. Is this the part you wanted to talk about, or I can continue? Oh, I, you know, I'd like to make a comment here on, on maybe some of these smart goals here. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think uh, measurable. It, you know, it, it, weightlifting. It's it's uh, fairly easy. You know, we got so many numbers. We deal with numbers and training. We deal with you know numbers and competition. So it does uh, make it a little bit easier. And um, mm -hmm. Yeah, they definitely need to be, you know, specific goals. And when you go back to the process goals and, and such, I think we often, we don't think of the process goals so often. I think that's one that's, that's overlooked. I think everybody's, uh, of course, big on outcome goals and uh, performance goals. Weightlifters are big on getting personal records and, and such. And uh, of course, you know, winning medals and, but, you know, to, to me, that's sort of where that, you know, I've, all the sports sciences are important to a coach. I've, I've, I've got a, uh, one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Mike Stone, has always said that, you know, coaches should be like um, doctors in which doctors study medicine or they study science for two years. 
before they, you know, work on performing uh, the art of medicine. And, you know, coaches, yeah. you know, he, he, he likens that the coaches should study the sciences. I mean, study biomechanics, you know, study uh, physiology, study motor learning, motor development, study sports psychology to use those skills as a coach. They all help and they can integrate, you know, like if you're working on, on technique, you know, use your process goals, you know, you know, what are you going to achieve that day? What is your goal? Is your, is your goal to, to keep that back flat, to keep it tight throughout the movement? Uh, is your goal to, to finish the pull and the snatch? So, you know, you can actually in working technique, you know, we, we should, you know, use our, our goal setting and our process goals when we, when we work on, uh, you know, specific technical aspects of the lift. So I think all those sciences, they, they, they're, they're integrated. They're not, they're not utilized uh, independently uh, as often as we think as, as a coach there. Um, yes, yeah. Yeah. I agree with you 100%. It's important for coaches to develop the knowledge and expose them to themselves to those skills uh, uh, so that they, they are better coaches, you know, and be more knowledgeable uh, in, 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 in their uh, uh, work. Yeah. And again, like we've mentioned before, I think the psychology is, is one that sort of, you know, coaches always say, yeah, we, you know, we're going we're gonna to get to that. But I think it needs to be one of the... <laughs> The first things from day one, you know, I, and again, talking about technique, I think, you know, a lot of these psychological skills we talk about, um, you know, we shouldn't wait till somebody's getting ready for a big competition. I think it's just like, you know, with technique and weightlifting, once you've taught someone technique, it's oftentimes hard to undo it, you know, yeah. and if you've learned bad technique, it, it's oftentimes hard to reverse that and i yeah, think a lot a lot nervous. with psych yeah with psychological skills and training and attitudes and motivations and those basic things we talked about um yeah we need to do those from day one because it's a whole lot easier to undo something if you know when you're when you're getting started rather than to wait five ten years yeah. down the line so they're all important yeah. Sorry about that light. I'm in this new office and it's got one of those automatic light things. And if I'm not moving enough, it goes off. So if you guys are wondering, that's why I'm okay. moving about and I go light the dark here. It's not okay. that I didn't pay the electricity here at the university. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and achievable, I, I, yeah, I, I think oftentimes that's important. And, you know, in weightlifting, you know, we need to make those reasonable goals. Isn't it true that those goals that are difficult but uh, attainable are the best goals? If you set them too easy, you're always going to make it. And if you yeah. set them too hard, then nobody expects you to make them anyway. So, yeah. like, is that, yeah, you want to set those goals. And, and I guess they can be set for, again, not just for what you're going to snatch and clean and jerk. You mentioned that, you know, they need to be set for, Short term needs to be for, for your training lifts as well. And what you're going to do, what you can accomplish in the technique. And it, as you say, also that time bound. So, you know, by, by when are you going to do it? Yeah. You know, so those, those are all important there. Yeah. I have one more thing when you talked about the goals and behavior, that's like drives me crazy as a coach, you know, it, or it has and it probably does other coaches who all say oh you know I want to do this I want to go to the Olympics but their behavior doesn't match you know what their goals are that your the, the the behavior has to match the goals and you know it it, it reminds me we've had a group from Canada and particularly Quebec have come down to train with us on numerous occasions and uh, Christine Girard a uh, gold medalist from London. Christine came to a class of mine once when she was down here for a training camp and we were just asking questions. And I think one of the questions I asked her is, you know, you know you've really excelled in recent years, you're world-class and such, what made the difference? And she said, she used to be a weightlifter when she went in the gym, but then she realized 
that she had to be a weightlifter 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So when she got up in the morning, she didn't say, what do I want to eat? What do I need to eat to be better? You know, and that was, to me, that goes along with athletes and their behavior to achieve yeah. their goals. So you have to, you know, sometimes you take it to, you know, if you want to achieve that goal of going to the Olympics, you may need to be a weightlifter 24 seven. I can deal with athletes who say, Hey, I just want to go to this local event and get a total. And, and okay. So, you know, we can set your goals a little bit different, but you know, if you're going to set those goals high, then your behavior uh, has to match that those goals, you know, match your behavior has to match how high you set your goals. Yes, and I agree with you 100%. And it speaks to the character of the athlete and the yeah. behavior, and also the character of the coach and the behavior that they, that, that, that they show. You know, there's a difference between good and great athletes. You know, um, good athletes, yeah, they can win um, a medal, but great athletes, their character speaks to the spot that they are in 24 hours. Right. Yeah. And they achieve great things. Even applies with coaches, you know, great coaches, uh, the character speaks volumes um, and the relationship they have with their athletes and they're really great role models and they model the behavior that they want athletes to see. For example, if you want your athletes to come on time, come on time. Yeah. If you drinking uh, discipline within the team environment, Make sure that you lead by example. If athletes know, if they, they know that the coach um, does things that, uh, that they can account for, then they know. And then they know that they can also do things and not be accountable to them. Right. So the character and behavior is very, very profound. Okay, do I move to the next slide? Can yeah. I, are you done with the yeah. question? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, I want to just say a couple of things uh, about uh, major barriers to goal setting uh, and specific to college student athletes um, and the reasons why they say we are not able to set goals. And one of those is lack of time that they have to deal with school as well as with sports and other engagements as well that it's very difficult for them to set goals and meet them because of, of those kind of those dual identities and dual engagements that they find themselves uh, uh, having to deal with. Um, but in addition to that, uh, they worry a lot about stress, that um, engaging in a number of activities puts a lot of stress and they may not maybe have the resources and the capacity to execute all that they are supposed to engage in. Uh, also fatigue as well as academic pressure uh, and social relations that they have to, 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 to maintain uh, uh, as they engage in sports and other engagements. But, but also, you know, I've seen some work here that speaks specific to Africa since we have uh, uh, the focus here is it, 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 it's for Africa. Uh, where student athletes don't have the luxury of tutoring that's supposed to be given if you're a student athlete and all that support services that our student athletes may need uh, 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 in, in Africa and that makes it very difficult for them uh, and it's important if you're the coach to realize these pressures that your athlete is dealing with that they're trying to balance school and sport they're trying to you know meet all these other factors that they are that, that they're trying to, to 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 deal with and try to support them in the process so that um, they, they they don't find themselves a, 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 a lot I know Kyle you wanted to speak to some of these yeah lack of uh... You know, time management's a great thing for, for athletes to, to do. I mean, to get actively involved in, in time management, do a little course on how to manage your time. Because, you know, we talk about uh, stress and a major stressor is lack of time. And we know that, yeah. you know, if we talk about overtraining. And again, we get to that mind-body relationship that, that overtraining um, can can be a result of, of too much stress. And much of that stress is um, psychological stress. 
things like mismanaged time and, and, and you talk about social relationships and academic pressure and all those things, anything you can do to manage your time and uh, you can reduce a lot of stress and even other stress management techniques are good for athletes, you know, different types of relaxation, you know, yoga, whatever it takes. Everybody, we know athletes are different. People are different and different things can help people deal with stress, but oftentimes, you know, um, dealing with those, those things there, uh, uh, to try to reduce your stress, uh, and particularly time management, those things are, are very important there. Yeah, that's very crucial. Uh, also, uh, uh, managing your time and, and I'm, I'm glad you said that, but the other thing about student athletes is that because you're a student, you develop a student identity and you spend a lot of time with your student peers. In addition to that, you are an athlete and you develop an athletic identity and also have to spend time with your athletes' friends. Then sometimes student athletes tend to look what's more enjoyable between the two. If the sport is enjoyable, they're good friends in sports, they spend a lot of time in sports and undermine the other part. Then they don't do well in the classroom. And then they go to the classroom, then, then they get a D. Then people say, oh, they're not academically sharp, but it's because they never manage that time very well and then didn't do very well in the classroom. And then build a stereotype that they're not academically sharp. But if they balance their time very well and balance their activities very well, can be successful in both and getting all the support that they need uh, uh, to be successful at balancing the two. Uh, then these are uh, major goal uh, barriers for Olympians like the top uh, uh, at, at most elite level. Um, if you look at the previous barriers, was like lack of time, stress, fatigue, academic pressure. But here on the other side, it's lack of confidence. But a lot of time we think athletes are the most confident people. But now when they're at the Olympic Games, there's a lot of pressure at major games, very, very, a lot of pressure. And them interacting with their peers and people at the same level, and they, they, don't, they don't have the confidence to set those uh, 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 difficult goals or lack of goal feedback. And this is very crucial because um, the athlete says the goal, you as the coach provide the feedback and constantly evaluate the goal to make sure that the athletes get the feedback that they need for the goal that they have set. Sometimes too many goals that are conflicting or just too many and sometimes conflicting. For example, at an Olympian, uh, the next Olympic Games, the athlete could be also a student who wants to achieve academic success, want to be a lawyer or an oncologist or something. But they also want to be an Olympic gold medalist. Or maybe they happen also have a family. So these are conflicting goals that they may have set. Because for you to win a gold medal at Olympic Games takes a lot of sacrifice. That may sacrifice some of these. So because of those conflicting goals, then the athlete does not succeed, sometimes in any. But if there's good prioritization, good guidance, then athletes can know what to do when and be successful. For example, if universities allow for flexible programs, where instead of a four-year degree program, it's a six-year degree program for student athletes. Or if they want to take a gap year or freeze their programs for one year, allow them to do that. Then they can focus on their sport so that they can be successful in it. Also, family and personal relationships. We talked about it in the previous slide. Also, starting a family and having uh, those family commitments as well. Because, for example, it's a fact if you are from Africa, let's say you are from Botswana, and most competitions are in Europe. And it costs about $1,000 to fly from Southern Africa all the way to Germany or another part of the world. So now the best thing to do is not to be flying in and out, to fly there once, you live there, and then you'll be taking train across Europe in competitions. That means you're away from your family and you don't spend time with your family. So being able to navigate those spaces uh, 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 would be key for success and finding time to do those. Also work commitment. I mean, even at the Olympic games, a lot of African athletes, they have full-time jobs. Some of them are police officers. Some are in the military. 
And sometimes some employers may not give them the privilege. They say, I'm giving you one month leave. And those work commitments, and they know the pension, it's with the work that they have. Because also being an Olympian does not necessarily mean you wealthy or you making money from this sport. And then the principles that I want to discuss, uh, we're nearing the end of, the, of my lecture. Uh, set smart goals. We talked about smart goals. So when you set a goal, make sure it's a smart goal. Set moderately difficult but realistic goals. We talked a little bit about that, both short and long term goals and then set performance and process goals, as well as outcome goals, so a combination of that. Set also practice and competition goals, don't just set for competition, but what do you need to do at that day for practice? And don't just think about them, write them down. And keep records, like uh, my colleague Kyle was saying, keep those records, what you're gonna do that day and what you did that day. And develop those goal achievement strategies. What do you need to do uh, to achieve the goal that you need to achieve? And then also here, it says that what to do, what is urgent. Not everything may be urgent at that particular time. And prioritize them. There could be something that is very crucial that needs to be done at that particular time. But there could be something that's completely long term. You don't need to do it right then. It can wait a year, it can wait two years, and can be done later. And doing those priorities is very, very crucial. And some of the common problems in goal setting is convincing student athletes and people who play sports to set goals. Even though we all agree goals are crucial for success, but sometimes convincing co coaches, convincing athletes, convincing everyone, we need to sit down and agree on what you want to achieve. Failing to set specific goals, we just have a general statement of intent. It's good, that, it's good to set very specific goals and when you want to achieve them. But setting too many goals too soon. Too many too soon. It's important to agree, okay, I'm gonna start here and move progressively where you want to be at. It's also okay to adjust. You set a moderately difficult goal, you know, was a little too difficult, you revise it so that you can uh, 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 set the one that is within your resources and within your skills. And fail to recognize individual differences. And this is important for coaches. Sometimes they just assume that, oh, okay, they're 10, so they are all the same. There is variance, even activation for them. One before the competition, one may need to read the Bible or read the Quran or, or do some things. The other one may need to play, play some, listen to some music. The other one may need something completely different. And also, very crucial, what you say before athletes go out. Sometimes you say things that would further activate them, make them very, very nervous and anxious. Also not providing goal follow-up and goal evaluation. We talked a little bit about that earlier. That is important that we follow up on the goal and we also evaluate uh, the goals that we have set. So I've enjoyed every bit of this and I think I'm gonna hand over to my uh, uh, colleague Kyle uh, for questions and, and, and comments. So these are my contacts in the screen, uh, to ts at Gmail and my cell phone number. And I'm also available on Facebook. Uh, you can read like my page on Facebook. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Tube. That was great. Um, I want to emphasize, you know, to, to follow up here, um, you know, if you have any information, you can uh, contact me. Uh, I, through IWF, uh, some of you have my may out there may have my uh, WhatsApp or uh, email. I'm always willing to share anything I have there. But you know, please contact uh, uh, Dr. Tube because he's got a, a wealth of information, and uh, you know, can't cover everything in sports psychology in a short time. So I think it's 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 good to follow up with things. Uh, one thing, though, I want to mention on the goal setting, the last thing is uh, writing things down. It's so important. And it's so easy now. Again, um, you know, all the athletes and the coaches are on their phones all the time. You know, mm -hmm. um, I like something I saw once. It's got the 
It's got the cross through the through the phone. It says phones don't make you any stronger. Cell phones don't get you stronger. So put that phone down once in a while. But they're great yeah. for for writing down your goals. You know, yeah. you know, you can put them on a piece of paper, but you can put them in your on your phone because you're always looking at them and look at them all the time. You know, check yeah. those goals, and it's good. You know that the coach brings up. You know. I guess, you know, meetings on occasions with their athletes to go over those goals to, as you put that, you need to, to follow up and evaluate the goals because they may change. You may need to lower some of your standards. You may need to raise some of your standards, but, yeah. you know, you know, I think goal setting is one of the most important things in sport because it can influence other type things. Like we mentioned motivation. So by just writing your goals down, achieving your goals, it's going to motivate you more. I think oftentimes if you see you're, you know, doing well and, and, and such, it may do some things to uh, reduce your anxiety there as well. If you see that, that improvement, it builds that confidence over time. So I think even from with younger athletes uh, up through uh, Olympians that, you know, goal setting should be implemented uh you know, with, with your athletes that you're working with. Yep. Now we've got some questions. I think, uh, uh, that, uh, Jalud and Mahmoud are not with us anymore. So it's, it's us right here. And I'm going to look at these here. Um, and just read these questions. I guess that's the best way. If you have questions, you can just use the chat room. Um, cause I'm seeing that. So here's the first question we had is how do psychological counseling for athletes within, how do you do psychological counseling within 10 minutes before the competition? What should you do? I guess, 10 minutes before the competition, what last minute things yeah. that, that a coach might say. Yeah. I see the, and thanks for the question, uh, to my colleague over there. Um, you know, if you're the sports psychologist, for the most part, you'd have done a lot of things prior to that 10 minutes. And now it's key what you say in that 10 minutes because you could build or break the athlete because the athlete could be uh, with a lot of anxiety. So if the athletes need to be calmed down, then you can uh, give them positive statements that would calm them down because it's very crucial that last 10 minutes. Uh, and a lot of times there isn't much you can do in that 10 minutes, but rather than just calm them down and give them some uh, positive uh, affirmations, reassure them that they can uh, do well in the, in the task because it's, it's really right at the tip of it. Uh, uh, and what do you say? Uh, I, I can flip it either direction, but try to be very positive and ensure that you are calming the athlete down. I'm assuming that is an athlete who is a lot of in, uh, um, anxiety and i like uh, how there's a, an answer to that question from uh, another colleague that it's, it's all about the routine if you build the routine very well 10 minutes before the athlete is probably doing positive self-talk it's probably uh, getting tuned in and focusing on relevant cues okay thank you I'll see the next question here. Yeah, I, you know, I make a comment about that. Maybe related. It's a little bit different, but coaching cues. Uh, I know cues are important. I think there. This is your area that I think cues should be minimized as you get closer to the actual yeah. performance. Because you, you know, sometimes you get the athletes thinking about everything, and that should have been attended to uh, in the training uh, before yeah. a lot of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, I agree that athlete skill can be developed on the hand. It, it goes again with the athlete interest and attitude. If the athlete does not have skill and has a negative attitude becomes totally impossible to develop. So it's talking about development of, of attitude. Yeah. What are your thoughts yeah. on that? You know, I, um, I don't know about the impossible. You know, um, if you look at the talent development literature, it talks about two things, that talent development takes two things. One is the athlete themselves to the environment they are in. So they have to match. So there has to be a match. So the athlete has to be motivated, have positive attitude and want to do it. Then the environment should support that person. 
But if there's a mismatch, for example, if the athlete is very motivated and the environment is not good, then the athlete may not achieve the goals. If the environment is very good and the athlete is not motivated enough, then there's a mismatch. So now um, they have to match and for the athlete to be successful. So I think what my friend Alex is saying is that um, uh, then there's a mismatch. That's why the athlete has a negative attitude. Or maybe the athlete doesn't like the sport, for example, or doesn't feel supported in the sport and they're rebelling uh, 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 in that environment. So if there is a good intentions, good goals set by the athlete, and the environment supports that, then it's gonna, it can work out well. But if there's a mismatch, that's what he's talking about being impossible to develop. Okay, thank you. Then the other question, um, he said, why is it that some athletes perform better in the gym than at the competition? Uh, uh, yes, so um, the reason for that sometimes, because athletes in the gym, they're in a very familiar environment, and in the competition is an unfamiliar environment. So it's important that the coach tries to mimic the competition as much as possible throughout their training so that they are not far, far apart. Uh, and the athlete, uh, it, 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 it feels the same way or near the same way. Um, you know, there's some interesting literature that uh, particularly about motivation uh, 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 that looks at um, an athlete who performs very well under evaluation in front of others and those who perform very well when they are alone so now if you are the coach and you understand you acted very well you know that oh this one does really well in the gym and struggles outside or they are unable to to, to, to manage the stage very well and then you build them slowly so that they also understand that they can block out any distraction that could be coming from the competition space so, so, so uh, uh, mimicking it and trying to build athletes to perform very well in that, uh, 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 in that it. Then the next question also, I think it's a comment, uh, talking about cultural background. Can it make or break the athlete in terms of development more so that the society can put you under pressure because of cultural beliefs? Yeah, I agree with Alex uh, uh, very well. Culture is very crucial. Uh, 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 um, uh, expectations. For example, I know um, I'm from Botswana here. Uh, we're still trying to, we're moving away, you know, we've had 54 years of independence, but we're still trying to teach people that sport is very important for health, it's very important to, as an income for the economy, it's, 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 it's very crucial. We're still trying to teach people up to today. Uh, and, and, and try to move away from culture of play being just recreational and, 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 and that. So culture can break or, or make or break uh, 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 an athlete. Uh, is the, oh, there's another one here. You have uh, elaborating more about mental imagery uh, and how to implicate it in the movements itself. Okay. Um, you know, mental imagery, you can have a specific script for a specific movement. Um, specific script for a specific movement. And uh, let me use, um, uh, think of an example, maybe in, uh, uh, maybe Carl, you should help me with uh, weightlifting examples here. Um, I'm gonna, let me give you an example in, in track and then you can uh, think of an example in, um, in, uh, 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 in, in, in weightlifting. Okay. Yes. So, for example, um, you can have an imagine. Let's say you're struggling with takeoff. If you're a runner, and then you can have an imaginary script about you listening to the start to the person with the gun, and the gun blows off, and you actually hear the gun, and you imagine yourself hammering the blocks very hard and taking off from the blocks, and all the way the face is point. And when you are doing that you have a clear imagery for that specific movement all the way from the start to the end. For example, if you're a tennis player, you can have an imagery about serving and you're, you're moving your hand backward and all the way to serve. All the stages involved in it. 
And Carl, maybe you can speak to, to, to a weightlifting example. Yeah, like, you know, some, some weightlifters tend to get excited. They rush the lift and they may, um, they may uh, uh, ex you know, let their, raise their hips too high, too fast. The hips come up off the ground too fast. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so that's, you know, a specific technical thing. Again, we look at this, to me, I, you know, I see this integration again of, you know, these are, this is like maybe a process goal something you want to work on on your technique, but you can also, you know, we use video and such to look at it, but also you can rehearse it mentally, watch yourself, I guess you could say externally to see you do this movement correct, you know, to push those feet in the ground, extend those legs at the, at the correct uh, rate. And you can do it from inside to feel it. So you can practice these things, um, you know, with, with mental imagery that you have difficulty with. I, I think, you know, too, of uh, just somehow it came into my head. I think um, the old Strength and Health magazine um, that they used to have in the U.S. And uh, Tommy Kono, the, the great weightlifter, uh, who's a hero of mine, uh, he, he, had a, he always had a, he had a column called, you know, and he talked about training your weak points. And I think that, uh, you know, in all sports, we always want to uh, do what we're good at, you know, in the gym, you know, <laughs> and uh, we want to impress people, but you know, it's like work on your weak points, do it. When you visualize, don't just visualize that metal going around your neck all the time. You know, that's great. But, you know, visualize those things that you have difficulty with. Uh, there have been, uh, you know, one I remember is a classic study of, with basketball free throws and how people, some people actually did the free throws, some people just did mental rehearsal, some did nothing. And of course, those that practiced and did the mental rehearsal did the best, but there was still, people could actually shoot basketball free throws better from just the, the, the mental rehearsal, the mental imagery. So it's, 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 a, very, it's a very good skill that, that can, can help a lot of athletes, but I think it, again, it needs to be uh, practiced and not just, you know, used on occasions. And, and, you know, I think it's good to communicate with the coach on, on what skills you should work on and, and make sure you're not, make sure you're not rehearsing it wrong. You know, make sure you're rehearsing it uh, mentally correct that you know what you should be doing on specific techniques and in, in the sport there. Yeah. Oh. And then the other one says that with all that being said, so it's clear that the coach should always be, the athlete's backbone. I think it's a comment and I agree with that. So uh, in a case where an athlete struggles to improve, how do you handle that? Uh, maybe the athlete is struggling with a specific, uh, to break their personal best or, or struggling to cross over to, to, to the other side. It's good to kind of reflect uh, on the goals that you have set. Uh, maybe you have set it too high or find out why are they not performing well? Maybe they lack confidence uh, 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 and try to build that confidence uh, 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 or, or revise the goal, like I, uh, uh, like I said, and, and, and see what is the best way you can do to, to have the athlete uh, 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 cross over. Sometimes it's okay to take a break and reflect and focus on other things and then come back to it, you know? Uh, uh, uh. There are many ways you can go about it. I think that was the last question, Kyle. Uh, some of these. Well, we got a couple more here, I think. Okay. Uh, what should a coach do to an athlete who is uh, very good at training and performs bad during competitions? Um, uh, he always panics on the day of competition. So, somewhat related to Dr. Deploy's question there about the. Um, you know, being the guy that the, the lifter, the guy or girl that performs better at the gym uh, than, in, than on the platform in the competition there. So um, always panicking on the day of competition. So what could we do here? Yes. So we have to establish why does the athlete uh, panic during the competition? And, and like I said, maybe the practice is very different from the competition environment. And, and why does the athlete uh, panic? Uh, do they lack confidence? Um, do they panic a lot because they focus more on the outcome than the process itself? Because some athletes um, interpret 
performance uh, 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 or success on, through the gold medal or the result. And the reason why they are panicking a lot and nervous a lot is because the only way they understand achievement is through a gold medal, which is ego-oriented. Uh, but success can also be mastery, focusing and, and, and improving yourself and, and, and mastering the task. So it's important we establish why does the athlete uh, perform really good in practice, but competition, uh, they don't do as well and they're failing to translate from practice to, 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 to competition. And sometimes it's also the, because they're very comfortable during practice. And the strategy that the coaches uses, uh, it's unable to transfer them to competition. So we have to establish why it, it happened in that way. And, and, and I'm, I, I have worked with athletes like that, where they do well during competition, during practice, and they, during competition, they, they don't crack it. And some athletes only crack small games, small competitions. And like major games, there's a lot of pressure. And like world championships, there's a lot of pressure. Olympic games, there's a lot of pressure. But understanding the athlete, how to calm them down, also very crucial. And let me use this example, you know, that athletes are very different in how the coach can help calm them down. For example, if you look at Usain Bolt as a runner, Usain Bolt, if you go back and watch his uh, 2013 World Championships, I think was in Moscow, it was raining. And before the blocks, he was uh, asking for an umbrella from the audience. If you look at the face of each and every athlete, there was very tense. But for him, it was very smiling and very comical, if you like. And immediately the starter said, on your marks, he flips immediately and focuses on what he's supposed to focus on. But if you take another athlete like Michael Phelps, if he is before the blocks, he's going to be very focused, extremely. And methodical, if you like, cerebral, if you like. But two different athletes executed completely different. So the coach has to know, okay, how is my athlete? And how can I help him be successful at the task? And how can he reach, how can I suck him up to reach optimal level? Because they can be variants. Okay, Ka, over to you. Yeah, and just to add a little to that, like we've said before, I think we need to think long-term development with the athletes. And again, in competitions with younger kids, um, we may not take as many risks on the lifts and we may want to make sure that they're, you know, making more lifts and building that confidence over time. So, you know, if they're making all six of their lifts and, and, and local events and youth events, and as they get, you know, they, as they get older and they progress to higher level competitions, they've had so much success on the platform. I, I, I've observed that when they step on that platform, they know they're going to make that lift. They don't think about missing it. So I think oftentimes we, you know, we want kids to get personal records in, in, in youth competitions and beginning competitions, but I think it's important to build that success also, you know, in, in, in those early competitions. And I think it makes it better for them in their big competitions. Also, I, I tell the athletes, you know, straight up that I coach, I said, look, I'm going to love you just as much after this competition. If you win the gold medal or you, or you bomb out, you know, and again, it goes back to the, to the athletes knowing that the coach cares about them as a person and not yeah. just as an athlete that, you know, I stress that, Hey, you know, you're going to be, you know, the, the, the same person to me, regardless of your performance. And I think that takes a lot of the pressure off the athletes to know that, you know, that, you know, my coach is not going to be, you know, up, upset. Of course, he, he wants me to perform uh, well, he wants me to do my very best, but I, I try to take the pressure off the athletes there uh, and, and, and with, with them, you know, with my expectations there. So. And we have one more question here. I think it's the last one. Um, mm -hmm. We've got a couple. 
Um, some coaches are too dictatorial in most cases do not place premium on the athlete's view. How can this affect goal setting, be it performance or outcome? Yeah, it, it does. It's important that um, because success is for both of the coach and the athlete. So it's important that they work together uh, in goal setting uh, and sort of build the autonomy of the athlete and, and, and ensure that, um, that uh, 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 he's part of the, even the training program that gets developed. It's important yeah. that the athlete um, is part of it. Even the goal being set is also part of it. And the sense of ownership yeah. uh, on both of them. Because, um, you know, coach athlete is very crucial uh, 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 because the, the two of them are complementary and they both have to be committed to it, not, not one person. And if the athlete has a sense that the coach just gives me things to do and they don't listen to me, then the athlete is not gonna put maximal effort and they're not gonna be motivated and they may rebel. So it's important that, that the coach develop what is called autonomy support for the athlete, build that autonomy and have the athlete appreciate uh, 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 that their thoughts are crucial also, that their role is not just to run or to lift weight, but they, 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 they are very key player as well. Okay, we got one more question. How should a coach deal with an overconfident athlete who refuses to be given direction or guidance but fails to achieve um, his or her set goals? Okay, so you know, confidence is um, they can be someone with no confidence or lack of confidence, then they can be optimal confidence, if you like, and then it's overconfidence. So, overconfidence is not realistic confidence. So it's important that the coach um, not kill the athlete's confidence completely, but rather uh, be realistic with the athlete to say, maybe we should start planning regional. You need to maybe win in your village first, and then you can win at a regional level in your district. Then from the district, then we go national. Then from national, we can talk about subcontinental level and then continental level. And, you know, in the athlete, you also need, you need the confidence and you need that, you know, sense of I got this, but you don't need too much of it. So you need it well regulated and well moderated because if it's too much, then the athlete goes ahead of their competencies and their skills. So the best thing to do is to go back to the goal and say, okay, the last time this is where you have performed. And what do you think we can do moving to the next? Where else? If it was at a district level, maybe then we can think about competing in the national. If that they say, no, I'm going to Tokyo 2020 and they have never competed at the nationals, no, you come back and focus, go stage by stage. Be realistic about it. But don't tell the athlete, no, you can never be at the Olympic Games, no. So that is a staircase approach. Over to you, Kyle. Okay, I think we're about finished here. Um, uh, Jalud had to leave and, and Mahmoud and um, both of them have told me to pass on the regards and thank you guys for being here. And, and um, Mahmoud said, to, you know, thanks for the coaching and research committee, uh, the IWF for, for supporting this. And um, I'd uh, like to thank Zali, who's the guy that's uh, running this. It's his birthday today. And here he is. He's, he's uh, spending his birthday. Uh, mm -hmm. Happy birthday. Uh, you know, running the, running the, the show here. So I uh, thank all the, the people that have uh, helped in, in uh, you know, promoting this. And I'm so glad, finally, we should have done this before. So I uh, yeah, yeah. thank you so much for your time and hope we do some more things together here uh, regarding uh, weightlifting. 
Thanks a lot. I'm privileged Thanks. to have spent the time with everyone. Thank you. And thank all you guys for participating in this. I know it's different times, you know, different time zones and such. It's real early in the morning for some and late for others. So that each, each and every one of you, uh, thank you so much for uh, participating. Thank you.